Welcome to the first. You have a story. If you look back on your life, you've done things for the first time that no one in your family, in your town, in the country has done. This is Dr. Sandy. You have unknowingly paved the way for others without knowing it or even acknowledging it. This is where you tell your story so that those who come after you can walk in your footsteps to build their own firsts. Growing up, Jose Acevedo listened to his Native American Indian grandfather use storytelling to pass on his people's history. He decided to become that storyteller and was the first in his family to graduate college with a master's degree and better yet, to fulfill his storytelling dream by creating the Finding Arizona podcast. This podcast highlights small business owners in Arizona to tell their stories of how they started their businesses, and it also serves as a means of promoting the business. You can find Jose at jose at findingarizonapodcast.com and on Instagram at Finding Arizona Podcast. He's also on LinkedIn and most podcasts. Hey, everybody. This is Dr. Sandy. We are on the first podcast with Dr. Sandy. And today my guest is Jose Acevedo. Welcome, Jose. Thank you, Dr. Sandy. I really appreciate you having me a part of this wonderful podcast. And I can't wait to continue our conversation that we had a little bit off air. <laughs> yes, I just said, let's jump on. Let's start recording. <laughs> I get it. So I was asking you about your podcast and what that's about. And if you want to tell the audience what you do and how you came about to have your podcast. Yeah. Okay. So my name is Jose. I have a podcast called Finding Arizona Podcast. I am a producer and a kind of founder and host of the podcast. And what we do particularly is we actually highlight and focus in on small businesses throughout the state and give them a chance to tell their story and their passions. Uh, I started this in grad school. One of the great things about starting it from the ground up is that I got to curate and kind of focus in and play around with all of our different strategies and different opportunities of who comes in the door and things like that. I was telling you behind the scenes that my wife joined me along when early on when we were first dating uh, and she fell in love with what I did and why I wanted to do this. And the reason why is because I actually grew up on an Indian reservation up northwest or northeast of Arizona. And my grandfather was um, in our culture, an elder holds a lot of the stories. And so he held a lot of the very um, ritual stories and, and he was very much an advocate for storytelling. And growing up in that you know family dynamic, I just kind of took that on as my own kind of thing is being able to speak with people and listen to people and, and understand that those stories are important. So hitting grad school and just being a screen printer, um, I was helping business owners and hearing their stories. And for me, it was important for them to get more marketing, more um, publicity and things like that. And I just took it upon myself to grab microphones and, and just learn the craft itself of podcast producing and just kind of went with it. It snowballed into my life more and more. And it kind of just basically took over every weekend and every, every kind of little moment that I had free and spare. I did a lot of things to make sure that our podcast kind of kept afloat and kept going. And so now we are at over 300 episodes. Um, my wife and I are just constantly bombarded by people who want to be on the podcast. And, and just it's a very exciting time for not only myself, but my, for my wife and for my son, who they're all a part of this um, big podcast lifestyle. And it's very fun for us to kind of be able to share that with everyone else, too. Now, do you... Do you record or do you go live? Uh, we do a little bit of both, actually. Um, we have produced a couple of live episodes where we're actually going live and then using the recording later down the road for kind of a podcast episode. But yeah, we've, we tend to mostly stick with the recording aspect because it's a little bit more of the um, post-production aspect of making sure everything's kind of nice and crisp on the audio end and then being able to produce some write-ups for them as well as um, 
uh, allowing ourselves to make and create um, Instagram posts, social media posts that will provide for them on the back end so that they can promote it themselves. Oh, so that's what I do too. I do give some promo material, which you need to send me. I don't think I saw anything for you. I just take some pictures from, from the business owners and I give them a promo video and a PDF. Yeah. And that is always so helpful to them as a business owner that they get that and they use it all the time. I see it pop up on social media all the time. They also told me the other day when they have to go to a client, it's a great thing to show what they do and that they have some press. So kudos to you. I'm glad you're doing the same thing. Thank you, Dr. Sandy. I really appreciate that. And you're here because you had some first. Mm -hmm. Uh, I started this podcast because I really wanted to feature business owners and, and people at large who are doing things for the first time or the first in their family to do things and make it kind of a legacy piece for them yeah. so that they ha can have this and show it to your kids. Just like you're doing your storytelling, this is our visual storytelling for yeah. business owners and for people who are doing things for the first time. So let me know, what is your first, Jose, or are your first? Yeah, I would um I would have to say one of the big things is this podcast is one of my like very first. I don't think any of my family members have uh you know a business or even like a secondary kind of implement that has been ongoing as long as I've been producing this podcast. There are a couple of family members that have um certain items that they've kind of started to build and started to make into business and which I'm totally proud of. And, but I think one of the greatest things that I can say is my education is probably one of the biggest part of my first is I'm one of the very first in my family to gain a secondary education. Um, my master's degree in landscape architecture, I have and I also use my degree um, for my day-to-day -day job. So that's really one of those aspects of like, I'm very proud of, I'm very um, kind of, it's been a part of my life for a very long time. And I've been encouraged by my parents to can, you know, use it, use my knowledge and use my education for the best of my ability. So between, between the podcast and my, you know, actual life as a, as a landscape architect, I think I have those very first as a guiding light for my younger cousins and relatives who want to continue uh, doing things that, you know, they've probably never done before or just starting out doing. And so I've had a lot of questions about my business. I had a lot of questions about being a business owner. And so it's all very great and fantastic uh, for my family to kind of, I don't know, use me as a, as a way to, you know, gain knowledge, use me as a, as a, um, uh, I don't even know what to, as an encyclopedia or as a resource. Now, did you have to go away to school or you went to school close to home? I, uh, so when I was starting out, um, my family was back on the reservation um, and they were about five hours away. And so it's, uh, it is kind of a long travel and I didn't have a vehicle. So for the first two years, I was there all by myself, um, kind of staying on campus working as a resident, well, freshman year, I wasn't working as a resident advisor, but um, as I got into what I could do on campus and things like that, I started to become more, um, you know, stuck in the campus lifestyle, but it wasn't until I got into junior and senior year where they kind of came down and moved closer to me, still about an hour away, but close enough where I could take a bus or at that time I had a vehicle that was able to go over and, you know, say, see them, um, you know, every couple of days. And that was really great for me. I, I think the first couple of years having the independence to, you know, rely on myself, rely on what I could do, um, really helped me, you know, become more independent and more of an adult. Now, was that the first time your parents, left the reservation or they were already 
living yeah. off the reservation. Yeah, um, they actually, so I should, yeah, tell this story. They, and, and what kind of Indian are you? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a member of the Hopi tribe, which is a small, very small tribe in the northeast uh, near the four corners of Arizona, which is, uh, if you look on a map, Arizona is, has a corner piece and New Mexico, Colorado and Utah all are, you know, that's what they call the four corners. But this is a small tribe. Uh, my parents actually met in the military. They met in basic training, so they had me uh, born here in Phoenix. And then when my brother was born, we actually moved all the way to um, the eastern part near Philadelphia, outside of Philadelphia, Allentown, Pennsylvania. And that's where we, my brother and I grew up until we were about adolescence. When I was probably about 11 or 12, we moved back to the reservation. Um, and that was because my grandfather had become a little bit ill and my grandmother was retiring. So my mom felt it was necessary to also gain cultural perspective because we had been so um, disconnected and, and far away from our culture for a long period of time that she actually was like, OK, let's move back and let's you know actually get you guys um, closer and more enriched in life. So that was really fantastic. It was hard, but it was definitely a learning experience and, and helped us really gain a lot of perspective as uh, teenagers. Yes, I was just going to ask you that. How did you adapt having, you know, never lived there and then having to, that's a big cultural shift. Yeah, it's a very big cultural shift. Um, so my brother was a little bit more, he, he, he could he could adapt more. He was very, he's still kind of young enough to make new friends and, and they were open enough to, to allow him to come in to their world. As for me, it was a little bit harder. I definitely was um, a little bit more of a challenge. And for me, it was the aspect of, you know, uh, losing friends, gaining friends, and understanding this culture that I didn't understand for for a long time, and that's where my my grandfather and, and a couple of cousins that were close to the family came in and, and allowed me to um, really, I don't know, I guess the word would be um, challenge them and and you know speak my mind because I was so used to um, questioning a lot of things, and that was from learning from the East Coast is just you know what who, where, when, you know, always, you know, why. Um, so that was a really big part of growing up for me is just that, that aspect of like, okay, well, I'm here. What do I do now? And so I took it upon myself to really, you know, grasp a lot of understanding from my grandfather and from those um, relatives that allowed me to talk to them and, and, and that's where, you know, conversation, dialogue and yes. storytelling came into my life at a very, uh, critical time is, you know, that's, that's a part of life is just, you know, when we were, when we were eating, talking and that, that back and forth, that was just, I could still remember it in my head. It's like in that culture, dinner or eating in general is a slow process, slower yes. than it's, it's a very long um, an hour long thing where, you know, you have conversation, you sit down, you talk to each other. And that well, was not used to that. Jose, in a lot of countries outside of the U.S. and mm -hmm. cultures outside of the American culture, mm -hmm. food is a prime time for conversation and catching up and everyone sits together. Yeah. Here we grab a burger and go sit in front of the TV, mm -hmm. right? It's yeah. not so familial. But I have to say most cultures that I see food time is a storytelling time. It's a learning time. And I'm Jamaican and my family's Jamaican. And that's how we grew up. Grandmother yeah. telling us, you know, stories about people we don't know and, and probably will never know, but who played such a rich part in our, in our lives of what yeah. we are today. And I can still repeat some of those stories, even though I never met the person, but mm -hmm. there's always something in there that ties back to who we are. So I totally yeah. understand how that is. 
That's great. I mean, again, it's, it's another part of like our, what connects us a lot of the times in the conversation with our guests is being able to reminisce on the past and reminisce on those stories. And I think a lot of the times when we do, when I do my podcast too, I think a lot of them connect with me because I'm able to, I guess, draw back from that experience and be able to open up in that sort of way. And so I'm so thankful to my grandfather and to my relatives to allow me to learn and, and grow because I don't think if I stayed on the East coast, I don't think I would have had that kind of um, lifestyle or at least not be able to learn in that aspect. But I think one of the greatest gifts that my mother would give me is being able to move back and, and live with my, with my family out there in the reservation. You didn't think it was a gift at the time, I'm sure. No, <laughs> no. no. It, you could ask my mom too. She'd be like, oh man, she she had such a headache. And I, you know, and it was, again, I think it just comes back to, it's like, I, I stick out when in cultural aspects, like I don't look like most of the Hopi men out there. They're, I'm six one. Um, a lot of them are shorter than me. Yeah. And, the, you know, it's just, again, it's it, you, when you, you stick out the, you know, you kind of get the the jokes, you kind of get, you know, a little bit of picked on, but it's one you're of those noticed. things. Yeah, you're noticed. And so, um, but, you know, I, you know, I, I started fitting in more and more. And I think the aspect of like my humor and my my intelligence and just, you know, all different parts, like I really started to hone in on certain things that allowed me to really gain more, you know, friendships and gain more, um, you know, just being able to fit in more. And so I graduated and I, I was actually a part of a big thing out there is running and cross country is a big, you know, team sport. (laughs) And so that was one thing that I took uh, that I went to and I was like drawn to, and I, I really it helped me a lot to fit in a little bit more as being able to be a part of that team and be a part of that, that culture. I would fail that. (laughs) It's not for the faint of heart, especially out in the Arizona heat. It's not for the faint of heart. And so it was, I've been there and you guys are having record temperatures Mm -hmm. right now. So I would not be out there running. I'm like, I'll meet you. I'll drive and I'll pick you up. Jose at the end of off the line, <laughs> but yeah, running in New York is pretty hot too. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, the but, humidity. I can, yeah. I can, I definitely remember it. The humidity is a big part of that. Yes, but you know, so what are some of the things that you feel were kind of pitfalls for you by being the first one? Like, mm-hmm. did you have a challenge being the first? Did people like the fact that you were being the first? Or I hear some people say, you know, you think you're better than us because you're doing this. And who do you think you are kind of thing? Did you yeah. get any of those challenges? It's, it's definitely like, um, so one of the things that I can say is like, yeah, when you don't have anyone to lean on, especially for those tougher times where, you know, I wanted to drop out of college. I wanted to go home and, and, and not do it. There was a, I remember specifically a very hard time where I was like, I don't, I don't think I'm either ready or smart enough to be here with these types of students. But and did you I, feel pressured that your parents were giving you this? Did you feel the pressure of staying in school because you were relying on, they were relying on you rather I, I I didn't feel too much pressure because I, you know, I, I called my mom. I remember this one conversation that I had with her. I called her and I was like, I don't think I'm, I'm good enough. I don't think I'm, you know, I don't think I belong here. And she, she just encouraged me that like from the very get go of when I was born and from the, when they started educating me and throughout my whole career of schooling, she's like, you always, you know, you always picked it up this time. It's going to take you a little bit longer. So, you know, don't feel like we're, you know, I guess the, the pressure wasn't as hard on me because my mom always tried to, you know, shield me from that. But I think for me, I always kind of put the pressure on myself because I, again, I'm, I'm really on my dad's side of the family. I'm the oldest and I always felt kind of like they wanted so much for me. And they, well, my dad is one of five. 
and he's the oldest of his family. So it's just, again, one of those stacked on, and my name actually, Jose is kind of a family name. So, you know, his, his name is Jose. My grandfather's name is, was Jose. And it's, it's kind of like this, you know, we look to you. What? Is your son Jose? No, I took, I took it upon myself not to, you know, (laughs) but he does have kind of a, um, his middle name is Jay. And it, it's nothing more than just the letter J, right. and it's a representation of um, my 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 side and my and my wife's side. Her her grandfather's name is James, and the J for Jose. And it's just kind of a combo thing for for both of us. So he he kind of holds it in a in a sense in a in a quote unquote way. But you know, it's just one of those things. I was like, don't I don't want to I don't want to put that kind of pressure on him. Um, but yeah, I don't think there was ever kind of like this aspect of like we want, we're putting you on the pedestal. I think for the pressure for me was like, how do I keep up or how do I even pass these classes just to graduate? Because there was a level of like, if you don't get a certain, because they only let so many kids into the program for the landscape and architecture programs. Yeah. So that's the kind of pressure I was in. I was like, how do I even make it? Like, do I have the skills or, cause my high school education was, I would have to say, bare minimum because it was government based the the i the ihs or the bia bureau of indian affairs they you know are the ones giving us the education and it comes from the u.s government and and it was just one of those things it's like it's bare bones sort of speak and you don't get the kind of lofty you know architectural classes or pre you know pre-college courses sort of speak um you just get the bare bones you know get your credits in and then we'll graduate you with your your degree or your you know high school diploma and then you're out into the world um so i just felt like i was behind i felt like i was like not because i i'd been in classes with kids that were you know who won architecture you know programs who've won oh. <laughs> awards and and things like that and i'm just like i don't know anything about this stuff i don't know what what software what things that we need to know i was just going in you know high hopes <laughs> and so yeah that was kind of the pressure where it was coming from me and then the idea of like i'm really the only like native student i could see in from my class was in you know my actual year I was like, well, I'm one of like one sort of speak. And so I kind of put that on myself as well. So there was some high hopes and some really down, like some real dark moments, but I just, I, I kept pushing through. I kept telling myself like, it's okay. You got this. And then you one step at a time. And that's, that's kind of what I kind of leaned on the most is one step at a time. Now I have to ask you this since, uh, you said you were one of one. What do you think of the current affirmative action laws and rules that are going into place regarding minority or diverse people? You know, I had this conversation um, and this is, you know, I, I wouldn't be where I am without certain leniencies of like, look, he's a native student. He's, you know, there was, you know, we need more diversity in this, in this program. And I I probably like more than not wouldn't have gotten certain things as like, you know, um, grants and other things like that. And as far as from my perspective, I just from my education, what I've learned through um, the history of, of Native Americans and Indigenous treaties and things like that, that that affirmative action helped a lot of native students and native indigenous people on all aspects, school, uh, job, things like that. And I, you know, for me, it's like, what happens if you take that away? We're already down, we're already downtrodden. Like there's already, when when they take it away, when they take it away, it's like, it's like, we're already you know, we're very few percent, like if you look at the critical numbers, like very few make it to get their bachelor's degree, very fewer make it to get their master's and doctorate's degree. You take that aspect of, you know, of well, we have, you know, we need more diversity. It's just, it just looks bad if we don't, you know, 
it's like okay yeah it's like you won't have it you won't have kids well you know you'll you get more downtrodden and more of these lower percentage numbers and so i don't know i mean i i want to say it's like we can do it we can always do it we can always have we put up pull our ups pull us up by the bootstraps but at the same time it's like you look at the history of it all and it's so it's like scary it's so scary to me and i want my i want my son to have the best i really do as a father now i want my son to have the best but does that mean that this needs to be in place so that he can have the best so that he can make it and that's still something that i'm still weighing in my head and with my wife and the conversations that we have about his education and about his upbringing and things like that we actually we just had a conversation like you know we got to go look at more uh, preschools and more kindergartens and get them in the list of a hundred other kids that want to be a part of that same school. Is he going to be allowed in? Do we need to be more critical, like saying he's native American? Like, you know, what, like, you know, that's the sort of conversations I have on the daily. When do you use that card? Yeah. When do you use that card? Yeah. yeah. And it's tough. I really think that, it's going to be a detriment to us and everything is being questioned now. So they're questioning the whole legacy mm -hmm. factor of, you know, especially the Ivy league schools. Yeah. There are kids who go in just because their parents went to that school and donates to that school. And so how is that different from letting yeah. people in who really don't have the opportunity mm -hmm. to do that? Yeah, I agree with you. There's, there's, again, it's like you look at the past of like, look at the, just look at the bare facts and numbers. And, you know, this percentage gets allowed in, or this percentage of your student body is this. And your percentage of, you know, the multicultural aspect is this. It's, it, you know, I would hope, my heart hopes that there will be people in the, administration i would say okay we're going to continue that regardless of this um motion in the laws and things like that we regard we're going to still keep this you know even more we'll allow even more my heart says that that would be the best you know hopefully what would happen but it's like what does you know, your head say <laughs> I, my head says yeah, there will always be someone trying to gain the system and uh -huh. there will always be someone trying to manipulate and gerrymander the system in the in so that their own can be allowed in or their own can be the majority. So yep. I don't know. I mean, again, it's like uh, it, it's a scary thing. And through your journey of education and being the first. Is there any one? Is there one person or people who stood out that really helped you and that you could say inspired you to become who you are today? Yeah, I think there's a lot of people who I couldn't do half of the things I do without certain people in my life. I mean, from the very first, we'll go back to when I was in high school. My my coach, who was my cross country coach, who who actually again, was a student at a college and uh, our assistant coach who was um, almost, you know, he was an Olympian kind of all American, all-star running person. It's like without those guidance of they went to go get their secondary education and they also promoted going to college and, and getting an education um, and coming back to the reservation and helping the, helping out the tribe. I think that was a big part of you know wanting to go to college and knowing that college was was in my grasp and was in my ability to go to to you know the people that i've met in college that were other indigenous uh, members of different tribes um they were big influences on like you know i met potential doctors engineers um throughout these different meetings and just being inspired by them uh, I think one in particular is just my own parents. They encourage me every day because they didn't get uh, the college experience and they wanted so much for both of their kids to continue on and, and learn more than they did so that 
they knew having a diploma from a secondary school, a college that yes. was important because that's what's, you know, that's what stood out is that you, no one, my father used to say this, no one can say no to you when you have that piece of paper, when you have it in your hand and you know that you did it and you, you completed it, no one else can say no to you. And so go, you know, continue to learn and continue to use this and you'll be okay and you'll be just fine in the world. My grandfather always said, use your CS, which is use your common sense. And that was one of the things that I always kind of was like, what does that mean? What is, what is that? And so, you know, it isn't until I've become a father and more educated and just like, yeah, just use your common sense in life and, and just know that the world will, will, if you use your CS, you use your common sense, that you will, you will be okay. And you will be, you'll know what to do in the right moments. And so now that you've done all of this, do you find when you go out into the world to try something new, it's a lot easier? Do you use what you've learned? Yes, very much so. I have, I have, from the moment I started this podcast too, has been a very helpful bit of, you know, um, trying thing, new things, trying, uh, stepping outside your comfort level will always benefit you more than hiding and, and being afraid. Um, I have met great friends and I have learned so much from my community just from this one thing than I would have if I went and did something else or just didn't do it all together. And it just was a leap of faith of like, I think, I have something here. I think, you know, back when I was screen printing, I was just like, I think if I just have these conversations, I think I might have an opportunity to do something here. And so I took that leap of faith and I'm so glad that I did. And are you mentoring any of the young people, like your nephews and your, mm -hmm. you know, are you mentoring the next generation? Yeah, I try. Um, you know, my, my younger, uh, cousins, yeah, they definitely reach out a lot to talk about, you know, business aspects, um, you know, wanting to do, uh, editing and, and all sorts of just different questions about things that they are interested in. But on top of that, I have, um, opened myself up to one-on-one classes, um, teaching, um, individuals who've reached out all together about wanting to start their own podcast. I've done plenty of those one-on-one -on -one classes. I've even uh, did, did a summer course with a native program to help educate uh, high schoolers um, that want to, you know, take a dive into podcasting and understanding what it takes to learn or even promote their own podcast. So that's definitely what I love to do now is to help mentor and answer any questions because, you know, I wish I had that when I was starting out. It's like it would have been, and I'm I'm such a student of the craft too. I love learning because I know that I don't know everything, so I love being able to educate myself still on you know things that I'm that I could do better or even hone a little bit more. So again, I'm an advocate for education all the way around. If you're a teacher keep learning. If you're um, a student, open yourself up to even more. Like that's just something that I've always been. It's like, you, you don't know everything. So you might as well just take the opportunity to at least gain something in, in the, in the time that you are here on this earth. And Jose, my last question, do you have business owners on your podcast from around the country or just from Arizona? So we have had a couple of um, program or business owners who have a national brand, but we always try and advocate or advocate for the fact that they have something here in the state of Arizona. So that's kind of like our little pitch to them is like, hey, look, we know that you're a national brand or we know that you have something across the US, but if you have a thing here in the Arizona area, we'd love to just hone that, hone that in a little bit more and just speak about that part of it because we've had Boy Scouts of America in on here. We've had a couple of other nonprofits that are just renowned for their worldwide right. reaches, but we really want to just hone in on that um, homegrown grassroots Arizona lifestyle. And it's because I love this state. I think it's 
something that I would say helped me grow into the adult and the man that I am today is just living here in this state altogether, whether it's the northern high countries or here in the city life of Phoenix. I think that this state has a lot to offer and a lot of um, different uh, everything, different everything. So for those who want to learn about Arizona more or those who are you know, here that are actual uh, residences or just born here. It's a fun, a lively conversation way to, you know, listen and hear from the people who are doing their best to bring this beautiful state, new things, new entertainment, new everything. It's a cool, fun way, I think, to learn about something that you may not have learned about before. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. I like Arizona but it's too hot. I'm sorry. I'm telling you, I'm telling you this now. If you, if you, if you go outside of Phoenix, Phoenix from Phoenix South, it's really hot. But if you go to the high countries, there's a place Flagstaff, there's, uh, there's uh, Kingman. There's a couple of other places up in the Northern countryside. It's, it's just beautiful. It's well, it's, it's cooler definitely because of the higher elevation and you will enjoy it. And it's actually got trees. It's actually got greenery and uh, you know, you'll love it a little bit more. I promise you that there's, there's a different place for everyone here in this state. I promise you. Very nice. I've gone to different places, Cannon Ranch and I've gone to Grand Canyon and, you know, yeah. you've done things when I've been there, but Jose, it's too <laughs> it's, hot. It's too and hot I, for you. I get it. I can't even use that anymore because New York is just as hot. So, <laughs> oh my gosh, happy. yeah. But thank you, thank you for coming on and sharing your story. No problem. And I truly, truly appreciate it. And I appreciate you, Dr. Sandy. Thank you so much. Do you mind if I promote my podcast just a no, little bit more? Absolutely, absolutely. Please do give us all your handles and whatever awesome. you. We do have a little bit of an outro for our podcast. So I'll kind of just say it right here and right now. You can find every episode of Finding Arizona Podcast at our website, findingarizonapodcast.com. All of our social media handles is Finding Arizona Podcast. And if you want to find, uh, send us an email, that's findingarizonapodcast at gmail.com. And we always say kisses, hugs, and belly rubs to our four-legged friends. And that's the end of our little outro. Thank you. What's four-legged friends? I love I actually so if you can see right here I have a little cat tree there actually there's two cats right under here and then there's a dog in the back room here so we love our four-legged animals at this house okay Uh, as long as they don't slither or do things like that we're nope none none of that here that's the same motto my wife has no nothing that slithers or hisses (laughs) Thank you for sharing with me. Thank you, Dr. Sandy. You have a good day. This is Dr. Sandy. Thank you so much for sharing your journey on the first, where no two stories are alike, even if the circumstances are similar. Let this discussion serve as inspiration for others to show what's possible, and more importantly, to produce seconds and thirds.